everybody. Welcome to the Phenomenon Paranormal Podcast. And we are a family paranormal investigative team and found ourselves during the pandemic um, a little going stir crazy. So we decided to do this podcast so we can at least talk about all things paranormal that we love. And we actually have 19 episodes in audio form that we've done over the past couple of years. And we will put links down there so that if you want to listen to what we've done in the past, um, you're more than welcome, including a recent interview with TV's Dalen Spratt from the Ghost Brothers, which was you know really fun and interesting. So we'll put that link there. But now we're happy to be part of the Morissette Media family and doing our video version of this podcast. So we're super stoked and hope everyone is too. So Today, I'm going to introduce everyone here in the crew, so you get to know us a little bit, and then we'll tell you what we're talking about. Um, my name is Christina, and I'm the lead investigator for the team. I'm Allie, and I'm a bit of an empath, but I also am an investigator on the team and do a little behind-the-scenes work. Hey, guys. I'm Anthony. I'm the lead researcher, an investigator, and tech expert. All right, so that's all of us. And today we're going to be talking about something that I think everyone can relate to in one way, shape, or form, and that is urban legends. So, you know, when we think about urban legends, um, what's one that pops into your mind, Allie? For me, uh, Slender Man, which is interesting mm -hmm. because it started as like a creepy pasta, right? Mm -hmm. But then developed into this huge thing, and it even led to a crime, right? Yes, it did—a pretty brutal one. Now, yeah. if anyone doesn't know what a creepy pasta is, yeah, there is a site called Creepy Pasta. And people would go on there and share their creepy stories, right? And right. these were mm -hmm. made up fictional, stories, yeah. yeah, all fictional stories. Yeah. Um, but sometimes people can start to believe them to be factual. Right. So the Slender Man started out that way. And, you know, we're not going to get into all the Slender Man lore here because it would take up like three episodes, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, it did lead to a pretty brutal, brutal crime of two young girls who were, I think, in middle school mm -hmm. who um, tried to kill their third friend. Um, at the behest of Slender Man, that yeah. they were going to commit this crime so they could go live with him in the woods. Yeah, almost like a sacrifice. Exactly, yeah. and thankfully the girl survived. Yeah. But it's just one of a handful of crimes that happened because of that creepy right. pasta. Mm -hmm. um, what about you, Anthony? I like classics. So one of the ones that I always go to is the Crybaby Bridge. Oh, which, yeah. Those of you who don't know, almost every state, every town has their own form of Crybaby Bridge, where the story goes a mother threw her child over the bridge into the water and now is destined to roam the, the waters looking for her child. And all you hear is the baby crying and the mother weeping. Right. Uh, so yeah. that's always one that you can find in almost every state. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things that endures no matter where you go. Oh, yeah. And, and it's made for a lot of fun YouTube and TikTok. Mm -hmm. um, investigation where they go and, and capture the crying in the yeah, background. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, these these are all fun. Um, mine is, I think, La Llorona, mm -hmm. if if you're not familiar with that. But, I mean, I, literally my grandmother told me that story. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was always used to scare little kids, yeah. you know, in Hispanic families like mine. <laughs> and, and so, but that one is, of course, the weeping woman who, mm -hmm. you know, had been spurned and then killed her kids and then kept going looking for them and mm -hmm. and if you hear the crying out there by a body of water you better go the other way because she's right. going to try and and take your kid or, or hurt you there's even a clip recently uh, of a town in mexico yeah uh, where the whole town came out at night because you could hear the screams right. oh yeah of a woman and it was very audibly found and police actually went into a building and found a dress yeah like a, a nightgown woman. or something and it's so believed in this town in this country mm -hmm that they burned the dress yeah. in the middle of the street to try and ward off the spirit because they were so afraid that La Llorona was coming. I remember coming. that clip. That was yeah. like bone-chilling yeah, screaming. It was so, really yeah, that, creepy. You know. Whether you believe it to be true or not, sure. I mean, just the screams alone are chilling. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Well, you know, today we're going to actually try and focus a little bit on our local urban legends. Yes. Right. And we're in the Richmond, Virginia area here. Mm -hmm. um, tons of history in this you know, this is the birthplace of our country. We have a lot of wars and, you know, bat battlefields still here. We have a lot of areas for um, a lot of wrong that was done. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's, there's so many haunted locations here in this yes. area. So it also brings with it some urban legends. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about three of them today. Yeah. 
Allie's going to start us off. So why don't you tell us the first one we're going to talk about? So I actually want to start by referencing Hollywood Cemetery, okay. which is the major cemetery out here in Richmond. Um, there is supposedly resides the Richmond vampire. Mm-hmm. So a little about him, there is a mausoleum there where it's marked WW Pool. Okay. And there are creepy things about the mausoleum itself. It's marked with just the date 1913, which is supposedly when WW Pool's wife died. So not him. Okay. Just the 19th. So there's no birth and death date. There's no birth or death date. So that leads some people to go, okay, is he immortal? And okay. And he would be a vampire, right? right? Of course. Even people take the WW on the outside and go, that looks like fangs. <laughs> so that kind of like adds to the lore it of it. does, right. but yeah. 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 And then there were like ancient Egyptian and Masonic designs on the tomb. Okay. And then of course people start going, that's a little creepy and immortal. Anytime you <laughs> involve the Masons and yeah. anything, yeah. It, it lends something to no it. No one trusts the exactly. Freemasons. Exactly. <laughs> Watch out, Anthony. I know, w- right? W pool actually was ran out of England <laughs> yeah. because he was a vampire. Right. So that is like the major like lore behind him is that he was ran out of England, came here, and now he's a vampire that haunts us, I okay. guess. Okay, all right. Um, so a little about, I guess, the story of what, um, sorry, story of how he came to be. Okay. Okay, so it started because the Churchill Tunnel which is near Hollywood Cemetery. Right. There, it was known for having almost like a curse on it because there were tons of floodings, there were cave-ins. Right. It was kind of disastrous, but people, you know, back in the day had to work there. And this is like a... This was like in a, a, like the 1920s. Like a railroad type tunnel? Yeah. Okay. Like where locomotives would be working and stuff like that. Okay. So basically, they felt that the Richmond vampire was haunting the Churchill Tunnel and causing the floodings and causing the cave-ins. Right. Um, so it kind of escalated from there mm-hmm. because there was a particularly disastrous cave-in that happened in 1925. Yeah. And during this, they saw at the end of the big cave-in a horrific creature exiting the tunnel. <laughs> and they described him as having fang-like teeth they said he was covered in blood, almost as if he had been, like, feeding on the people who had been trapped in the cave-in. And then th- he even had, like, rolls of decomposing flesh Yikes. hanging from his body. Mm. Yeah. And people assumed, because back then, W.W. Poole was supposed to have died, like, two to five years before that. Okay. Okay? But there were still sightings, right? So they thought that because of the decomposing flesh rolls like that... That's how they treated the bodies back then after they died. Mm. So if he was immortal, he may still be decomposing. But still but, walking but around. still walking around. So a zombie. Exactly. A zombie. <laughs> I, mean, so, I love it. You know, that's Hashtag kind of... Zompire. Yeah, yeah right? Exactly. <laughs> huh. So it's, it's interesting because that's what people saw. And then there were even people who claimed men chased him to try and see what he was doing like if he was feeding on these workers and they went to the mausoleum because he ran to hollywood cemetery right they said they saw him slip in before they could reach him others say they jimmied it open and saw him slip inside the coffin and saw the lid close and then they like tried to open it and they they didn't have enough strength like, it was as if it was locked inside. Okay. Um, that's what some of the reports were. Or he was holding it from the yeah, inside. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's and creepy. And the other thing that they said was that he was in the mausoleum screaming curses. So that, like, freaked them out. Scared and so, them away. Yeah, much. so they yeah. didn't want to go near him, of course. So these are all the reports of that day. Okay. But there's probably a more, I guess, truthful scenario. Logical explanation. Exactly, that turned into this urban legend. Okay. So we can talk a little bit about the history, I guess, now. Okay. Um, so on that day, there was someone named Benjamin Mosby. Yes. He was a fireman, and he worked there um, shoveling coal and different things underneath. When the bricks started to fall down, he was, like, yelling at people, like, oh, it's coming, you know? Yeah. And when the explosion happened, he likely, because they worked without their shirts, you know, it was hot down there, hard labor Mm -hmm. um so he likely was scalded Mm. by Mm. steam and hot water on his body 
which then would probably cause blisters right. and, and flaps of skin mm. and things on his body. Yeah. It's awful. So he actually did escape. He escaped by going under the like train. Really? Wow. Yeah, wow. he like crawled underneath, which caused more injuries, mm. which is likely why he was covered in blood. Mm -hmm. Even the explosion itself likely threw him back and caused the broken teeth. Ah. So when he emerged, it was probably him. Yeah. From what the story says. And he emerged and was, you know, in severe shock. Yeah. So when he approached people, he was very calmly just saying, can you please let my wife know I'm okay, not mm. to worry, you know, I made it out type thing. But what happened is he had collapsed and he mm. was just completely... God, that's sad. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really sad. And yeah. people just tried to help him, of course, but there wasn't too much they could do except for send him to the hospital where he later died yeah but some of the story goes back to the vampire because of how he looked they even saw him try and like run towards the james river mm. so that was where the whole yeah. kind of garbled retelling came in of him running towards the cemetery it was actually him running towards james river you know right right so things like that yeah i know? think i think this is going to be a, a a theme for each of the stories that we're going to yeah. tell today yeah. but you know urban legends are very much like a game of telephone. Yes. Exactly. Okay, so I, everyone's played that as a kid, right? And the circle on the story is totally different. Yeah. So you get one piece of fact that you start out with, right. like a factual, you know, event or what have you, and it can get turned over so many times that by the end of it, you don't recognize what happened. Right. So um, urban le legends can be fun when you're a kid, but then as you get older, like you hear this story of this fire, and you're like, man, that is... That's it's horrible. It's sad, yeah. you know. Yeah. But um, this gets even more involved, though, now yeah. after the fact, because then we go into missing body parts and so forth. Right. So, so like, with W.W. Poole, he was actually just a man in Richmond. He, he was born in Mississippi in, like, 1847. Right. Came to Richmond in the late 1860s. So he wasn't from England. He wasn't from England. <laughs> he was definitely not. And when he came here, he actually became a successful accountant. Okay. So he was a successful member of the community. In other yeah. words, he was a Freemason, so ironically. Freemason. Um, yeah. Who wasn't back in the day? No. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which yeah. can explain the Masonic design, sure, of course. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, and so... Basically, he was normal, he, and he died when he was 75 from pneumonia, which was around 1922, actually. Right. Um, and his wife had died in 1913. They had four kids. You know, he was very just like an average guy. Yeah. But because of this vampire lore, mm -hmm. you know, it turned into the urban legend. And even like by the 60s, 70s, you know, college kids, local, were, you know, telling this story of W.W. Poole, the vampire. And right. They were going to, you know, his mausoleum and trying to either, like, prove something to their friends because they, like, are approaching it. Or some actually broke in right. for medical students mm. and took parts of his body. Mm. So the ironic, Well, there's a souvenir for you, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the ironic thing is even though now people still claim to have, like, sightings of him and go to the tomb because it's, oh, it's W.W. Pool the Vampire... He's not even in the tomb anymore. They moved him and his wife oh, wow. to a different section of the cemetery. We can't blame because, them. Because, yeah, yeah, people were desecrating right. basically where he was, you know? Wow. So he's not so, even there no, at all. No, he's not there. So yeah. I'm sure we... he's definitely not a vampire. Yeah, but yeah. The interesting thing about the sightings is, okay, does that mean it's thought form? Yeah. Like uh -huh. we've talked about before. This, yeah. this is, we're going to have Anthony get into the thought form yeah. thing after he tells his story. Yeah. But that's also going to run true in all of this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not just the um, game of telephone, but the the after uh, effects of the fear of these urban legends and what yeah. it can maybe do. Yeah. I think it's right. like a perfect storm in a way because you got the fear mm -hmm. aspect. You got the thought form that it comes from that. And we'll get into what those are in a minute. But um, we also have the paranormal activity itself, the energy that is built up as a result. Right. right. The tunnel explosion, think about yeah. you got these two men. Who lived completely normal lives. Right. One who died trying heroically to save other people by warning them that right. this yeah. class was happening. And then years later, you have all these people telling the story of, you know, a vampire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whether you're 
the man who actually died in that tunnel from those injuries and you're hearing this story that you're pretty much a monster right killing people that's being told now or you're this innocent guy who's just a freaking accountant yeah. who's just trying to live his life who everyone's now saying yeah. is a vampire and yeah. now is yeah. the same. Look, think about if you are hearing these stories as these people mm-hmm. wouldn't you be roaming the cemetery too like trying to say hey this is my story tell yeah. tell it right that's true. You know? I mean, there there have been accounts of stuff at the tunnel, right? Yeah. More so than at the cemetery. Exactly, because people have walked by the tunnel and heard screams of, like, get me out of here. Mm. Or locomotive wheels screeching down right. there. Um, and different things like that, you know, very loud, as if it's, like, a super haunted zone because of what happened. I mean, when you have a tragedy like that, some yeah. really, like... Um, it leaves an imprint. It does, yeah. Well, especially because, you know, of... You know, after he warned them, everyone trying to get out of that tunnel, it was pure chaos. You know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's because right. they that's were right. yeah. when they're trying to get out, everyone's so desperate to be the one that escapes before the tunnel collapses. Uh, the stories were that they were pulling knives that they had on the Flash job and slashing each other, each other yeah. so that they would trip the other person and they would get ahead. Yeah, wow. Exactly. I mean, it was pure desperation. And yeah. Chaos. It was that fight or flight instinct yeah. kicking yeah. in and that much energy build up over time. From yeah, that kind of, for sure. oh yeah, it's oh, yeah. it's like an imprint on mm-hmm. the environment, mm-hmm. you know. So wow. yeah. that, that's one of those stories that just like I've heard it already. Okay, yeah. I know all this stuff. Yeah, gives you the chills yeah. when you yeah. hear it again. Because I mean, I can't even imagine being in that position yeah. of just trying to fight for your life yeah. and having to fight other people that you're trying to help. Yeah. yeah. So God, that's horrible. And some people weren't even recovered because they had to like abandon the rescue mission because at the time it cost too much money. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. And, they, you know, they didn't feel like it was worth it. In other words, the people who were in charge, which is really sad because there's probably still families day and... bodies down there that were never recovered. Wow. I mean, yeah. that much unrest, you know, that they, they never were found. Yeah. That's another imprint that, you know, can drive that energy to act up. So right, when people yeah. hear those screams or the, the vampire is seen. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, that's a lot of energy build up, man. How? Oh. Yeah, that's that's something I think that always sticks with me every time I hear it, you mm-hmm. know. Um, before we move to Anthony's story, because, I mean, I don't know what else to say <laughs> about this one. It, it, just, it's, it gets it's to easy. me. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Um, but I meant to introduce our producer over here at the beginning. This is Ray. Hello. <laughs> hey, Ray. Thanks for joining us in, in this podcast. Um, I wanted to ask you if you had heard any urban legends through your life, that one that maybe stood out to you. Well, I know there's the Mothman of Virginia, but mm-hmm. in Maryland, where I'm from, we have the Goat Man. I, I've heard of the Goat yes. Man. Right. Yeah. yeah. He, he scared the bejesus of me <laughs> really? as a kid. Yeah. I was scared he would go and drown my dog. That's oh, what wow. He does. Oh, how awful. He doesn't go after humans, apparently. The dogs. Oh, my wow. gosh. I didn't know that part of it. I didn't either. Yeah. We, we're Again, dog lovers here. Yeah. 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 It might be a telephone thing, but. Yeah. Sure. Of course. That's yeah. what I remember scaring yeah. me. Well, you know, wow. what's funny about that, too, is, you know, the, the idea that alien interactions they often go after dogs first before they take humans yeah that's the lore because dogs are seen as protectors right and so that's uh, interesting that that urban legend is born um in the same time frame well you know we uh, we always go off on tangents when we start talking about stuff but you know we always have the, the tie with paranormal activity in a location that a lot of times you'll have more UFO sightings, all of a sudden more Bigfoot sightings, yeah. and all of a sudden more ghost activity. All seems to be tied together. And, yeah. you know, so I always find it interesting when I hear stuff like that yeah. Yeah. with the animals concerned. Yeah. Because uh, then right away we're like, okay, those aliens. They're, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're going down. <laughs> As they don't even come from my animals. Cause Pretty much goat man's an alien. Yeah, yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. And, well, so. that's what they say about Mothman. Too, exactly. So. Yeah. There, there you go. Yep. Um, okay, so now I'm going to throw it to Anthony because he's right. got his own urban legend to talk about from here. Well, as much as the vampire is scary, mm-hmm. um, there's nothing more animalistic or bestial than a werewolf. Okay. And Henrico actually has his own werewolf, the Henrico werewolf. Yep. What's interesting about this is through all my research, there is no exact date for the first sighting. Um, it's believed it was like the mid to late 2000s that the first stories came out, but the legend has it going all the way back to the Civil War. Um, there's a story in the legend that a Civil War soldier was desperate to fight off the invading soldiers coming after him and turned into a werewolf to fight off these soldiers and died of his injuries as a result, and that it's his ghost that people are seeing. 
Good story, um, good story. But that's just the lore. Right. Um, the first sightings, actually in the 2000s, the first two were proven to be um, misleading, false. Like a hoax. Uh, yeah, a hoax. The police actually found two people who were dressing up in costume, pretending to be werewolf. Hey, so you're should, bored on a Saturday yeah. night. Well, <laughs> and, you know, and you're in near colleges. Kids are telling stories. It's natural. Um, so you think, okay, case closed, right? Henrico Werewolf, not really true. Stories are still being told of sightings to this day, as recent as a couple years ago. Um, this is an area in Henrico uh, called The Springs. Um, it's a recreation center. It was uh, formerly Confederate Hills right. Recreation Center, but it's now The Springs. And uh, the stories go that people who live in or around this area see a giant wolf, a uh, bipedal figure. Uh, it sometimes goes black fur, gray fur, uh, always with a white or silver streak in its fur. Um, always approaches on two feet first, okay. always standing upright. It's a little intimidating. Um, I'm not going to lie. And you. again, this is kind of where the telephone thing comes in because some people will say it gets scared as soon as you approach it and it takes off running into the woods. Other people say that it comes running at you, you know, as if to attack. From the woods, yeah. From the woods. Okay. Uh, other people will say that it kind of stares at you, waiting to see what you're going to do, and then takes off before it, it um, because of being afraid. Right. Um, the most interesting one is some people say that it's playful. Some people think that it uh, wants to come up and play with you and have fun. Right. Um, but then eventually will kind of slink back into the shadows and disappear. Mm. Um, but no one's ever gotten close enough to see its actual canine features, which was mm. interesting. It always takes off on all fours when it takes off. Okay. Uh, and so this is why, you know, the stories of what it actually is, we'll, we'll get into later, but it ranges. Um, but that, that's the Henrico werewolf. It's, so there was never like an attack or anything no, like that? No, it's never okay. been proven to actually have a physical interaction with someone, which is interesting. Right. Uh, however... There have been daytime and nighttime sightings of actual packs of white dogs roaming the area, okay. which is interesting. And I even will we'll include uh, notes in our links in, down below of uh, our sources. Okay. Uh, but there is a story from a woman who, you know, used to go to her husband's house when he was a teenager and they were living at his parents' house. And they would be in the backyard, you know, just smoking and hanging out. And all of a sudden this pack of wolf or wolf-like creatures mm -hmm would approach, all white and silver, um, but they would ignore the guy, the people. They weren't looking at the people when they walked by. They were walking past them, and what they said was it was eerie because they were in a trance-like state. Hmm. Hmm. They were kind of like mesmerized by something, almost as if something was leading them or calling them to a different location. Okay. And it was to the point where the people just didn't exist to these creatures, that, which was that's weird. That's kind of an eerie vibe, yeah. I guess. Very, very eerie. Um, so that was the the biggest sighting that I could I could find. Okay. Um, in my um, research. Modern day. Um, but it's interesting because the the area itself has a lot of history too. Um, one of the um, people who came there actually built the springs because it's known the area is known for its natural springs. Right. Yeah. And he brought his wife there to heal her because okay. she was sick. The illness is not known. Uh, but he actually helped build um, the electric railway from Richmond uh, to uh, a local cemetery during the Civil War. Oh, okay. They actually had so many, you know, dead among the Civil War during the battles that they had to build this railway to transport, transport them. to the cemetery directly. Um, so there's a lot of history to the Henrico area. Oh, yeah, yeah. for sure. You know, um, and there's a lot of buildings in and around Richmond that were actually used as makeshift hospitals yeah, and that are still standing. So that's where a lot of the paranormal activity that is reported tends to come from. Right. Or areas like this and yeah. areas where there were battles and yeah. transporting the dead, you know? Yeah. Well, that's uh, where kind of the energy buildup comes in because right. of all that death and all that, you know, history that's involved. Right. Um, and that energy can also lend itself to helping you know the thought form right things. yeah now thought forms we mentioned this a couple of times already in the podcast but there's a couple of different thought forms that uh you can get to there's a, a tibetan um thought form that is called a tulpa a tulpa is something that a singular person creates 
with, and it kind of forms its own identity, its own personality. Um, it kind of has like a free will. It's kind of like if your imaginary friend became free thinking, right? you know? Um, and then there's an egregore. Right. An egregore, I think that's what we're dealing with in these cases here. Right. Um, an egregore is a collective group of people will put their energy into believing this story and a uh, actual entity will form to make it so that these things actually do exist. So, for instance, the vampire. Right. The story is told so many times from so many people, whether it's college kids or locals coming through, yeah. that all that energy collectively brings this vampire to life, not in flesh and blood, but in energy form. Right. And so when you see sightings in the distance of a vampire dashing through the cemetery, or you hear the, the sounds of the werewolf at night, it's, that's the energy buildup. That's a thought form haunting. Okay. Right. Um, it doesn't make it any less real. Yeah. Uh, it just means that it It'll didn't exist. Differently. Yeah. yeah. Well, a good example of this, and we've talked about this, and you can explain it more, is the Dybbuk box. Oh, my gosh. Which yeah. we've talked about before, but um, let I'm mm -hmm. going to let you explain that theory. Yeah, we'll probably have to do... We have an episode where we talked about all the details previously, um, but we'll have to get into all the details more in a future episode because mm -hmm. it's such a loaded thing. Yeah. Pretty much the the, the Divid box um, was a story about this person was selling a box that supposedly was Jewish connected. Mm -hmm. um, and the mythology was that the Jewish community had sealed a demon inside of this box using wax and their their... They had a whole ritual. A ritual. Yeah. Um, and they sealed the demon in the box. And then the box somehow got sold uh, out of the family. And a person bought it. At an estate sale. At an estate sale. Right. And opened the box. And the demon came out and started attacking this guy and his family. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out so years later. That's what you naturally do, right? You put yeah. it on eBay. He put it on yeah. eBay. He sold it. Years later, it's now owned and featured as one of the centerpieces of Zach Baggins Museum in Las Vegas. Right. For those of you who don't know, Zach Baggins, a uh, well-known paranormal investigator. Um, to leave it at that. <laughs> and so uh, the Divot Box has now been proven from the original poster on eBay to be a made-up story. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there, there is a Divot in Jewish folklore, but it's not a demon. It's a ghost. Mm -hmm. It's a person. It's the spirit of a person who kind of is just wandering. Yeah. Right. Um, so this guy made up a story because he wanted to sell this box and he was trying to create the lore. But he saw how out of control it got because now there are thousands of people selling different divot boxes, claiming that they have demons inside of them. Yep. And it's also kind of appropriated Jewish folklore and yeah. Jewish culture. And so he came out to say, hey, I made this up. This was a false story. But you can't dissuade people no. who yeah. already have this in their minds, much like the urban legends. Yeah. They, yeah. they fully believe all, every Dybbuk box has a demon in it. They yeah. just do. It's so out there in the culture now, in the world, that it's ingrained into the fabric of our society now. Right. As one of the urban legends. And because of how widespread it is, that culture, that energy buildup has formed thought form hauntings. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, a case uh, that we know of because we followed another group of paranormal investigators and uh, we've covered this before in another episode. So you can go watch and listen to that. But pretty much this group was called in because this guy claimed to have a divot box with a demon um, haunting it. And he was very convinced he knew the exact name of the demon. Um, he knew what was inside of it. Uh, so these investigators took the box. And they managed to get an MRI scan of the that was inside of the box, and it was all modern day stuff. Yeah, all stuff that was bought modern day. Yeah, and yet they were still getting interactions with some sort of energy entity. Yeah. Uh, so what they came to find out was that it was a thought form entity. It was created. So many people had been told the story over the last few years that it really came to life, and it thought it was a demon. But the second they started treating it as a regular person, as not a demon. The, the negative interactions started dying off, started dying down. Fear was yeah. driving it. Fear sure. was its yeah. driving force. And once you took the fear away, it became a normal box mm -hmm. with a little energy still attached to it. But it wasn't harmful. It wasn't scary. Yeah. Um, and that's what I think is taking place here. Mm -hmm. The same kind of thing that was happening with this, these divot boxes. Right. Areas can have the same effect. Just because there isn't a flesh and blood werewolf or vampire roaming these areas 
yeah. doesn't mean that these werewolves or vampires don't exist. Yeah. Right. They just exist in a different form. Almost like in an apparition yes. type way. Right. Kind of like yeah. a ghost of a werewolf or vampire, but one yeah. that people created. One right. that didn't exist before. It was never living in our world. Yeah. Well, in, in another episode, we're going to get into a, a case that we actually investigated mm -hmm. where this really rings true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll, we'll be able to dive in, into it more. But um, fear can drive a lot of things. Oh, yeah. So um, we will, that's going to be a fun one. We'll yeah. Dive in. Uh, before I tell my urban legend story, um, I want to remind everybody to make sure you comment, like, subscribe, um, because we're going to have some really interesting episodes for everyone. Um, you're not going to want to miss it. Um, please share as well. And um, there's going to be opportunities for you guys to see a lot more, too, down the road of investigative stuff that we're going to do. So we'll talk more about that, but I wanted to throw that in there yeah. before we move any further. Um, so this one that I'm going to tell, a lot of people may have heard about this legend that aren't local, and there are reasons for that, um, but it's one of my favorites. So um, this one is less than three hours from here in Richmond, but it's still in Virginia, and it's the legend of the Bunny Man mm. and Bunny Man Bridge. Have you heard of that one, Ray? I don't believe I have, no. Okay. All right. Well, this one... Um, Actually, if you were to search for Bunny Man or Bunny Man Bridge on TikTok, you'd see a bunch of stuff come up right away. Um, the legend of the Bunny Man, God, it takes on so many forms. Um, this, this can go way back to like, I think it was 1904. Well, here, here's what I'm going to do. I want to read to you what the current urban legend is about the Bunny Man. And then yes. we're going to go back in time. Because the story is just as important as Absolutely. The it's yeah. like, it's kind of like Bloody Mary, and you'll see mm -hmm. why I yeah. say that. Okay. At the stroke of midnight on Halloween, a killer in a white rabbit suit awaits. Lore has it, if you speak his name three times, he'll appear. Bunny man, bunny man, bunny man. But don't expect to survive. He'll slash your throat and leave your body dangling from Bunny Man Bridge. That is the current urban legend. It's a little disconcerting. It is a little disconcerting. All the best urban legends always have that, though. Of I mean, course. Yeah. Even made up ones that we know, like Candyman. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think what's, Got it. it drives that fear up because right. it challenges the, the person to oh, go, okay, many, I'm well, the bravest one. I'm going to be yeah. the one who yeah. does it. I, as a child, had sleepovers where, oh, we're going to go play Bloody Mary. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I had the perfect setup in my house, let me tell you. I had this little, <laughs> um, like, it was one of those, okay, living areas here, and then you have this side of the house with two bedrooms and this side, mm -hmm. right? So we had a door that you shut once you left the living room. Mm -hmm. And you had this little square that was like, boom, boom, um, where if you shut both bedroom doors, bathroom door, this door that led you in there, pitch black. Oh, and you're mm -hmm. in a little square space. Yeah. So, Oh, sleepovers at my house? That's where you did Bloody Mary. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Anything scary that you got in that little box of and you course. were like, okay, we're going to go for it. Sounds like a good idea. So fun times. But anyway, so here's the thing. Okay, um, Bunny Man Bridge and the Bunny Man himself has a few different iterations. So way back in like 1904, mm -hmm. supposedly the story goes that there was a mental institution not far from where this all takes place. And they were transporting prisoners on a bus. Mm. And there was an accident. The bus overturns. Um, this is like any movie you've ever seen about transporting a bus yeah. full of mental patients, right? I mean, it's and Halloween so, exactly. all over again. How, yeah. The beginning of Halloween, yeah. perfect yeah. example. And so, you know, some perish, some escape. They round up everyone except for two of them, mm -hmm. okay? So... There, the, there's one that they say was, you know, obsessed with rabbits for whatever reason. Yeah. He was obsessed with rabbits. And he was out in the woods killing rabbits, wearing their skins, mm -hmm. hanging them from the trees, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, apparently he was, like, trying to avenge the death of his wife and child. Where that came in, you know, we'll find out later. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then, you know, there were kids making fun of him, so he decided, well, I'm going to, you know, take my hatchet, 
get rid of these kids and, mm. and you know, kill them, hang them from this bridge that yeah. is now known as Bunny Man Bridge. As one naturally does. Yeah, of course. Of course, of course they do. Yeah. Um, you know, you kind of have to. Yeah. Um, so then we can fast forward a little bit to 1949. And what actually happened in 1949 was there was a big murder case here. And this is in the small town of Clifton, Virginia, okay. where this bridge is. Okay. okay. So a uh, mother and daughter are found murdered. A um, couple weeks later, the husband is arrested. Mm -hmm. They, you know, beat the wife to death, buried the daughter alive. Mm. Horrible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely horrible. Um, so I think what happens is they take this story, mm -hmm. and, and he actually was committed to a mental institution. Okay. okay, for the criminally insane. Right. Right. Um, so now it becomes, oh, he went back in time to 1904 and escaped. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. he's going to avenge the, All you know. Connected. Right. Yeah. So we take little bits of these these events. Yeah. Right. Don't even know if there really was ever a bus that overturned us well, and course. escaped. Yeah. But, you know, we're, we're going to put that in the mix. Yeah. Okay. So then um, now we have another one, which is that... Um, this guy escaped currently in like modern times from an uh, insane asylum. Okay. Um, he throws axes or chainsaws at car at couples that park by the bridge. Okay. Right. Okay. Like now the lovers lane. The lovers lane type yeah. of scenario. Yeah. yeah. But now there is some truth to that one. Right. Okay. Right. But not until 1970. Okay. 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 So in October of 1970, there's an Air Force cadet. That actually does go park by the bridge with a woman. Okay. Mm. And a man dressed in a white bunny suit comes out from the tunnel and has a hatchet. Okay. And he throws the hatchet through the windshield. Mm. Now, okay. there's actual police reports on this. This actually did happen. Wow. Um, they tear out of there. They're yeah. not waiting around to see how serious this guy is. Well, yeah. no. Yeah. Um, and then two weeks later... There's a new housing development, also like all on this road, which is Guinea Road. Okay. Okay. Um, and there's a security card that keeps hearing a tap, like can't figure out where this is coming yeah. from, right? So he finally sees someone who's very tall, dressed in a white bunny suit, um, taking a hatchet and just chopping away at one of the beams on the front porch that's being built on this unbuilt house. Okay. And... The guy, they kind of make eye contact, but yeah. he can't identify the guy. He's got a bunny head on. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the bunny gets scared off and runs into the woods with his hatchet. Uh, in neither account was the Scott, the suspect ever found. Okay. You know what it reminds me of is the clown sightings years ago. Oh, yes. Yeah. When Absolutely. people just dressed up as clowns with their weapons and started, but they were never found. No. No. They were you know? trying to scare Yeah, the that was terrifying, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so go ahead. Were you going to say something, Ray? I just remember that. That was terrible. Yeah, yeah right? That was It was so widespread. So, yeah. 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 I mean, the, some of the videos that came from those ordeals mm. were terrifying. Yeah. Especially as someone who, growing up, always had a fear of clowns. Mm. So, yeah. um, so they never caught the bunny man that did those, those two things right. in yeah. October of 1970. But... Um, you know, that kind of really adds to that that mystery and that, that lore right. of, it, you know, was this a young guy? Is this man still around? Is he, you know, running around with his hatchet? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what now was starting to happen, especially pre-pandemic, is, you know, this story is so built up now that there are you know, people that go down there on Halloween mm -hmm. to try and get a glimpse of the Bunny Man. Right. Mm, of course. And so the local police department would have to go stake out Bunny Man Bridge so that they could make sure, well, you know, we don't want some copycat coming down here and, you know, terrorizing people who are coming to see the bunny man or right. someone's going to get hurt and they'd have to try and keep people away. Yeah. Yeah. But even like to this day, there, are, you know, are young people or young, you know, amateur paranormal investigators who want to prove that they could go down to Bunny Man Bridge yeah. of and walk down that tunnel. Yeah. And say the bunny man's name three times. You know, I saw one on TikTok yeah. that just, you know, these three people start walking in and they hear a noise and, oh, man, you never see three people run so fast out of this tunnel. Right. You know, so, you know, this has gotten to the point, though, where it's so widespread that it was featured on an episode of Scariest Places on Earth. Classic. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah the, the classic show, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it also has had several movies based off of the Bunny Man legend. Oh, really? Yeah, there's some right now on Tubi that are available. <laughs> you can watch Bunny Man Massacre, and they all put their different spin on it. And yeah. A lot of yeah. young co-eds are murdered and, and all these different things. Um, 
but the best one that I saw is much more recent. And someone actually had the sense to, you know, because it actually, it added to some tourism for Clifton, Virginia. Of course, kind of right? like Mothman did. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They have a Mothman festival yeah. here in yeah. Point Pleasant, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's very similar to what happens in Clifton. So this guy opened up a Bunny Man Brew Pub. Oh, of course. Right three miles down from Bunny Man Bridge, right on wow. the same road. And he says... Wasn't that he, he in the military as well? Yeah, he was also an Air Force cadet. Isn't that funny? Right? Uh, so full circle. Yeah. But he says people actually come in there dressed as the Bunny Man. Oh, Wow. You know, so I mean, the love and obsession a little, a little far, but, <laughs> a little yeah. bit, yeah. but you know, it, it works, right? Yeah. It's yeah. probably one if tourists want to come and see Bunny Man Bridge, where are they going to go to get a bite to eat and get some beer? Yeah. I'd be in, interested to see if the energy buildup only extends to Halloween or if it could be like any time because well, of how many yeah. people go I'm there sure now. It could be. You I kind of want to go investigate. Better to go on the off season, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's going on Halloween. Yeah. 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 Go on Easter. Yeah. <laughs> another, oh. another bunny opportunity. Hey. So, yeah, I mean, um, that one's always one that I really like and is kind of widespread, and a lot of people know about it all over the yeah. country. Yeah. So, um, so we were going to um, talk a little bit about the, you know, we talked about the egregore thing, but to me, this is one of those things that it's like with all of these stories. Mm. Yeah. You could take that and say, are people's fears driving these legends to just right. keep going and going all these years later? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I got to think that it does because, yeah. you know, you know, we've been to a, a location that was a haunted location that once, you know, it, it that's where you're getting scared all the time, oh, all yeah. the time. And when the pandemic hit and there were no patrons going through, that fear factor all of a sudden kind of hit this weird yeah. Yeah. level and weird it vibe. Yeah. yeah, and they were like, why aren't we able to scare people anymore? And yeah. Yeah. The real activity begins. Yeah. You know? I mean, it takes a life as its own. Yeah, it yeah. really does. I mean, that's the thing about these thought forms, you know, they're not, you know, going on, they're not robots that are pre programmed to right. act a certain way. Um, once the energy is put out there, they believe themselves to be, you know, sentient and alive right. in their own yeah. way. Yeah. Um, they, you know, maybe they don't understand that, you know, they exist purely from our thoughts or whatever. Right. Um, but they do think. And so when they don't have that expectation of what they're supposed to do and what they're supposed to have as far as interactions go, and that stops. Right. Yeah. What do they do? Yeah. You know, like. Where does their energy go? Yeah. 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 Does it dissipate or does it go looking right. for what it's missing? You well, know? well, I think, you know, um, on our next episode, we're going to reflect a little bit about something we talked about on our very first podcast, which mm -hmm. is um, the quantum consciousness theory. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to get into it, but, you know, in our opinion, that could be something that's driving hauntings, period, yeah. um, in various forms. So um, it challenges that idea that a ghost or a spirit has to have died on a property. Exactly. Because right. that's always the, the thing. Everyone thinks that, oh, if someone died here. That means their spirit must be here. And they're, they're trapped here. They have yeah, unfinished, yeah. Business. unfinished business. But yeah. don't get me started. We'll get when we get into that episode next. Uh, the quantum consciousness kind of just kind of pushes just that, that like, yeah. limit. Yeah. You know? that yeah, it really yeah does. so. Yeah. Well, I was going to give everyone sort of like a glimpse real quick onto what they can maybe expect. Um, we're going to be doing um, some investigative stuff here, like during certain episodes. Right. So um, certain techniques that we would maybe use if we were out in the field and do a little um, experiment here yeah. um, with, with Allie as sort of our conduit for that. I'm um, a bit sensitive when it comes to Just a little bit, so. yes. The things she gets are pretty amazing. So uh, yeah. yeah, it's kind of a sight to watch um so we're going to do that in the next episode as part yeah. of what we're talking about here with this whole quantum consciousness thing and uh, we're going to have some good interviews coming up um we are going to talk about other topics like this that have to do with the paranormal um obviously there's been a lot in the news lately about ufos yeah um, yeah ufos are coming we'd be remiss <laughs> if we didn't yeah. talk about that a little bit yeah. Yeah. um definitely going to be talking about Bigfoot and the multiple versions of them around the world. All yeah. the big yeah. feet. All the big feet. All the big feet. So many big feet. <laughs> so um, we did want to throw it out to anyone watching that um, if you have urban legend stories of your own, if you have um, video clips of um, haunted occurrences or lights in the sky, haunted locations, yeah. different things, or even 
a haunted location out here in the local, you know, yeah. general vicinity of Richmond, Virginia, that you think we should go check out, um, please do um, send us an email. All that information is going to be here, um, either on the screen or in the con or in the um, info section, so that you can get in touch with us and say, hey, we yeah. think you should check this out. You know, we want to be interactive with you guys. So. You can also direct message us on our socials, right. which are also listed down below. We'll have them um, all for you, and we'll be posting clips, you know, of our investigations and evidence that we catch because that's all part of it too. Absolutely. Uh, wanting to be open and we'll show you guys how we go about doing this so that right. you know that it's not just a hobby for us. We actually truly believe in this stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, hopefully by the end of it, you will too, if you're, if you're a skeptic, but we do invite that, you know, yeah. hey, if you have something to say, um, you know, let us know. There's room for everyone here. Absolutely. Uh, it's always great to challenge our, ourselves and to think about things in a different path. So. Absolutely. So that's us for today. Um, we do have something that we like to say when we wrap up. So, Anthony? Well, this is uh, Phenomenon, a paranormal podcast. Thank you for joining us. And remember, don't fear the unknown.